good morning and welcome to this uh, session uh, dedicated to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, special thanks to Thierry um, for putting this uh, session into the program and also for planning for a special WPC Health last uh, December in, in Geneva. COVID-19 uh, has appended our societies. It has put the world in great danger. It has exposed deep inequalities. In less than two years, uh, more than 230 million cases have been reported and over 5 million people have died. At uh, the highest point in 2020, half of the world has been forced into confinement and 90% of children of school age couldn't attend schools. An estimated $10 trillion output is expected to be lost by the end of the year. So clearly, our economies and the very structure of our societies have been shaken and multilateralism certainly put a test. So this is why I look forward very much to this session, welcoming five distinguished panelists and colleagues. Uh, Professor Christian Brechot, virologist, former Director General of the National Institutes of Health in Paris and of the Institut Pasteur, and Chair of the International Virus Network. Jean Kramartz, uh, who is the Head of Healthcare Activities at the AXA Group. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Juliette Twakli, uh, C Chair of United Way and CEO of uh, Accra, Child Accra in Ghana. Professor Robert Sigal, CEO of the American Hospital in Paris. And Professor Haruka Sakamoto, joining us um, by video from Japan. Uh, from the Department of Health Policy and Management of Keio University in Japan. So, as we begin this uh, discussion, let me make four points. The first is that the pandemic is not yet over. As we speak, over 400,000 new cases and 10,000 deaths are reported globally every day. Current hotspots are the USA, Brazil, India, followed by the UK, Turkey, Philippines, and Russia. National responses across the world stem from the complete lifting of restrictions in Denmark to new statewide lockdowns in Australia and a growing political and public health crisis in the US and where the number of infections increases, we see again unsustainable pressure on the healthcare system and on healthcare workers. So the bottom line here is that the pandemic remains a global emergency and the future remains uncertain. My second point is that the world was not prepared. Although public health officials, experts, previous international commissions, review committees had warned of the potential of a new pandemic and urged for robust preparations since the first outbreak of SARS, COVID-19 took the world, large parts of the world, basically by surprise. National pandemic preparedness has been vastly underfunded despite the clear evidence that the cost is a fraction of the cost of responses and losses incurred when a pandemic actually occurs. Too many governments lacked solid preparedness plans, core public health capacities, organized multi-sectoral coordination, and clear commitment from leadership. And this is not a matter of wealth. Uh, I believe that COVID-19 has shaken some of our standard assumptions that the country's wealth will secure its health. Actually, 
leadership and competence may have counted more than cash when it comes to responding to COVID-19. Careful scrutiny of the evidence and analysis by the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, the so-called IPPPR, of which, uh, on which I, was, I have been privileged to serve, uh, found multiple failures and gaps at every step of the response in national and international responses. The declaration of fake, the public health emergency of international control, uh, concern, that is the highest uh, risk in our legally binding international system of health regulations, did not lead to a rapid response and certainly did not lead to a coordinated response. And it wasn't until the number of COVID-19 cases increased steadily and had spread internationally that action was taken. So in summary here, the net result of delay, hesitation, denial has been that an outbreak has spread into an epidemic and an epidemic has spread to a pandemic uh, dimension. My third point is that we must work together to end this pandemic urgently. And of course, from a public health perspective, ensuring that all countries get rapid access to vaccines is essential to getting the pandemic under control. But as we heard already many times in this meeting, the delivery of vaccines under the current system remains painfully slow. Global solidarity is far away from where we would like it to be. And to paraphrase some of what was said yesterday, it looks like we're not learning of being an interdependent world. And finally, my fourth point is that as we work together to end this pandemic, we must urgently work to avert the next. Our panel's recommendation follow from the diagnosis we have made of what went wrong at each step of the pandemic in preparedness, surveillance, alert, early response, and of course, from our view of the leadership required to transform the system. And our panel came with at least the four following recommendations. One is the establishment of a new financing mechanism, a new financing facility, both for investing in preparedness and to be able to inject funds immediately at the onset of a pandemic potential. And that recommendation is very similar to that of the high-level finance group of the G20, of which Jean-Claude Trichet, whom I see in the audience, uh, was, was part. Second, a standing pre-negotiated multi-regional platform to produce vi vaccines, diagnostics, and essential supplies to secure their rapid and equitable delivery as essential global common goods. Third, a strengthened and empowered World Health Organization. And four, the establishment of what we called a Global Health Threats Council at the level of heads of states and government to ensure the ongoing global political commitment to and accountability for preparedness and response between and during emergencies. So to elevate somehow pandemic threats to the level of nuclear terrorism, climate or other uh, threats and challenges to the economic stability and peace. So these are the key issues around governance and the system that are currently being debated as we prepare for the G20 in October, as we prepare for the special session of the World Health Assembly in November. They're discussed in the UN in New York and they're discussed here at the WPC. 
So uh, here we are, and let's now start with our first speaker, Professor Christian Brechot. Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michel, and thank you also to Thierry de Montbrial, if I can have the first slide. Michel, as Michel has mentioned, I mean, we are still in the midst of this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, I just want to emphasize that we are facing these waves, and we do not know really the fine mechanisms of this natural evolution, but clearly viral variants, seasonal variation, and obviously the various precautions, as well as vaccines, are at stake. A uh, huge impact on health, on hospitalization, but also we should never forget the pending issue as to what will be the long-term medical consequence and the real impact of, for example, what we call long COVID. I believe that this is really something where we still have uncertainty. So what uh, will be the future? Well, first, we really have always to stay humble and careful. But for the uh, rich countries, we can really foresee a transition to low-grade pandemics due to combining vaccine efficacy, natural immunity, precautions. We will have new waves, uh, but we may hope for lower and lower rates of severe disease and death, but we have to pay attention to co-infection. But obviously, what about low- and middle-income countries. Uh, it's the year 2022 might well be the year of development of antivirals. There are new direct antiviral therapies, such as Monupiravir, which has recently showed very interesting results, and others which are coming, and the results will be in 2022. There is very, very debated impact of non-specific antivirals, such as targeting the infected cells, and there is, I believe, the underestimated potential of the monoclonal antibodies, not only for therapy, but for prevention in persons who have been in contact uh, with infected individuals. Now, always is the cost, uh, the, the issue of cost and production. The treatment of severe COVID-19 has uh, been very much improved. And so, main and related question, and this has been addressed by Michel is really the impact of uh, global versus national strategies and related to this, the emergence, potential emergence of new variants. Uh, okay, the next slide, which doesn't come, is a slide which shows the impact of the, uh, the takeover of the Delta variant in blue over the other variants. We have several variants, I'm not going to list of all of them. Interestingly, the two so-called beta and gamma, which show some resistance to vaccines, have remained very minor species. Will we have new variants? Yes, as long as we will have circulation of the virus. Will they be sensitive to vaccines? So far, yes but we don't know really for the future. But the very important point is that we have the tools for real-time genomic investigation of infectious disease. And it's about organizing the on-site capacities worldwide for the sequencing, for the database, uh, for this pandemic and for the future. This is really a very important issue. Vaccines, I don't want to discuss all of them. Obviously, the RNA vaccines are the leaders. The overall efficacy has been re just remarkable. They prevent hospitalization and death. Less than 0.01 percent, sorry, of vaccinated persons are hospitalized in the U.S. And death from COVID-19 are mostly, mostly death in unvaccinated persons. Do they act on circulation of the virus? Yes, to some extent, but not complete. In other words, vaccines cannot be the only solution. And there are major questions for the future, duration of immunity. I believe that we will need second generation vaccines with longer protections. Do we need to distinguish the, which correlates of protections, which markers? We need large prospective studies 
in various geographic and environmental contexts, will we need to adjust to variants? So far, not necessary, but we have to be careful. So this has been discussed already, uh, and this is a key point, obviously, vaccine inequality. I just want to mention a very recent paper in Science, which is based on mathematical modeling, which really demonstrates the impact of vaccine nationalism on the dynamics and the controls of SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV and the uh, really uh, return on investment that we can get from a global strategy. So what went wrong? Many things, and Michel has listed some of them. I will just focus in a very few slides on the science, uh, medicine and public health. We need to have a scientific driven questions, which means expertise. Always remember that the virus was actually sequenced as early as January the 5th of 2020 in China, and by the way, immediately made public. There is the issue of masks and of diagnostics. Diagnostics have been very much underestimated and will be key for next pandemics. Uh, very briefly, this is what uh, an example of a global virus network center. You have a rapid test from left to right based on salivary samples, molecular tests, low cost, very easy to develop in low income countries. We have apps. We must very much more work on these issues. We must also have other organizational schemes. I'm the president of the Global Virus Network. There are other networks, obviously, but merging really the scientists of all over the world to provide a real expertise, not an individual-based expertise. And it's about research, education and training, which is key for the future, advocacy, communication, expertise, reactivity, and partnership between academic and industry, which have been always at the heart of the Global Virus Network. So I will close on two slides. We need to see, to embrace this on a more global basis. Uh, we, we will have, and uh, Michel has mentioned this on the day, we will have other pandemics, be respiratory viruses, there is the long-term resurgence of Ebola or others. We know that it's about the interface between environment, animal health, human health. 70% of emerging infectious disease are zoonoses. They come from animals. It means that we must work on this ecosystem. It also means that when it comes to surveillance, we really want to target the human-animal interface, and this is a very concrete objective. But finally, we also need to incorporate nutrition, food safety and security. And this is my final slide. We need to integrate visions of different fields. Uh, it is now clear that the gut microbiota, this population of bacteria we have in the intestine, play a major role in the risk of COVID-19 and severity. And hence, it is really about the impact from left to, to right of the environment on the soil, the ocean's microbiomes, in turn on the plants, the food, the nutrition, and in turn on humans and viral pandemics. So it's really about the need to work on some specific items which have failed on these pandemics and to really embrace this in a global context. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you for sort of setting uh, the scene, focusing on um, transmission, on diagnosis, uh, and bringing the One Health uh, and even broadening sort of the One Health concept. Let me now turn to you, uh, Juliette, Dr. Juliette Twakli, with, um, I expect, an African perspective. Please. Thank you, Indeed, when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic began, two things became very obvious very clearly to some of us who were located on the African continent. One was that the West seemed to have huge capacity but little strategy. And we in Africa had a lot of strategy and little capacity. The second thing that was obvious was the importance of health 
as an important national strategic asset within our economies. The pandemic highlighted, has, as has been mentioned, health inequities that have been ongoing. Also, some other weaknesses in our systems, such as insufficiencies, inequalities, inequities, insufficiencies, and ineffective systems, as well as weak regional and domestic financing systems in order to procure appropriate medications and vaccines, etc., and the presence of often very asynchronous health regulatory policies throughout the continent. So each country in the continent had a different system to somebody else's, different levels of regulation. It was very hard initially to work together. There was also a recognition, I think, as we dealt with the pandemic, having already dealt with Ebola, that Africa and how we responded to this pandemic represented an important strategic shift in health governance. And we were slowly acquiring what I might call a soft power rather than a hard power in negotiating around health governance issues. The role of philanthropies and civic societies in the health arena was also enormously important. United Way Worldwide, which I chair, raised over a billion dollars during the course of the past one and a half years, helping over 27 million people who were affected by the pandemic. This is not just in health, but allied to health needs. And I think yesterday, uh, Honorable Amino, Aminatu Touré mentioned the recognition of Africa and Africans' own capabilities and the lack thereof, and some degree of confidence in recognizing it was now time for us to man up, so to speak, and start manufacturing our own medical pharmaceuticals and start developing medical programs and policies that work for us specifically. In addition, I think looking at the global stage, it's important that it's not just that we partner with other groups and agencies, but that we have equal status within those relationships. There has to be some equity in the partnerships here on in terms of health and health governance for us to be able to effectively be part of the solution and not part just of the problem within Africa regarding world health. I think that um, the local manufacture of pharmaceuticals has already begun. Um, I have to give a nod to the Louis Pasteur Institute in Senegal who have been doing enormous work, very impressive work, and serve as a beacon to many others. I think we also need more investment locally, and um, probably more in some of our public health initiatives on site rather than externally. When one looks at the ratio of the monies that were actually given to Africa compared to what was raised for the world, we actually receive very little and of the COVAX initiative, we've only received a fifth, one fifth of the vaccines that were originally pledged. So whilst people cite us for not having vaccinated enough persons on the continent, one must remember we haven't received anywhere near as many vaccines as we had anticipated. And finally, I would like here to say that this has been an excellent opportunity for recognition of the role of the diaspora of Africa in various capacities and in various roles. We have partnered in many of the global health initiatives that have occurred on the continent. 
we are moving into important areas that impact global governance, uh, global health governance, particularly in Africa. And here I am thinking of people such as my friend and sister, Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala, at the head of the World Trade Organization. But I must also cite locally placed African diaspora, such as Dr. Nkeke Zong, who ran an enormously effective African CDC on the, the continent itself, and was largely very responsible for the effects efficiency with which we were able to work in Africa dealing with this pandemic. And then, of course, myself in both the medical and philanthropic uh, arena, trying to coordinate both. But there are many more of us, and I think that we have to be recognized more as Africans themselves need to be recognized more on the global health arena. Thank you very much, uh, Juliette, and thank you for emphasizing how remarkably Africa as a continent came together in <clears throat> building the response and also thank you for uh, focusing on how partnerships be them private public or private public and of course when it comes to governance at the global level should be inclusive from the start um, that's certainly uh, a lesson that we had learned before, but we hadn't taken from HIV, from SARS, from Ebola. Um, next, let me turn to you, Jean, Jean uh, Camars. Please thank you. have the floor. Uh, thank you, Michel. Uh, what are the lessons uh, learned in this COVID crisis, which is certainly not over? And what can we say about global governance? from these lessons. Uh, first lesson, as uh, Juliette just said, uh, health is strategic. It doesn't mean it's important or very important. It means uh, it should be treated like uh, a military topic, meaning you have to invest in health well in advance uh, to, to face a crisis. It's not when the crisis occurs then you check your stocks of masks, that you discover that your uh, supply chain is based in China. And I have noticed that possibly uh, there was a crisis with China too. So uh, if health is strategic, it means that governments should overinvest in health to make sure that uh, they have the right equipment, they have the right drugs, they have secured their supply chain, and it should be done uh, permanently. It should be a, a topic of national interest, like we have oil stocks, three months, as I remember. Uh, we should have health stocks of drugs, devices, equipments, uh, and know how to operate uh, these stocks. And we should also invest in people, uh, because if you don't have the, the people uh, to staff the ICU beds, it's just like you don't have uh, any ICU beds. Uh, if this is understood by governments, it will have an impact on the cost of health, because it means that you invest for a peak, for a crisis, and you do not treat health as a commodity that you will uh, buy uh, uh, whenever you need it. And health is already over expensive. I mean, in, in terms of a percentage of the GDP, my guess is that it will cost more in the future because we will pay more as the doctors, we will pay more as the nurses, uh, we will pay more for drugs because we will ask the pharmaceutical industry to relocate uh, to uh, new countries. Is it good for uh, international governance? I'm not sure, because it is a dilemma of the prisoners. They should cooperate, but as long as they do not trust the others, they will not cooperate. This is a sort of a pessimistic view uh, that I have today, but nothing prevents uh, to, to, to change this uh, through a heavy work of an international organization to create trust between nations. Now, it's not only trust 
between nations, it is also what we have uh, seen in this crisis is doctors not trusting doctors, uh, population not trusting their governments. Uh, and uh, this is a huge issue because when we will have found, uh, as Christian said, the right vaccines, the right treatments, if doctors or the population do not believe that it can be used, we will not uh, solve the crisis. How do we build trust uh, in the 21st century, in the time of uh, metaverse, as it was explained? I don't think you build trust in uh, avoiding the social networks, in uh, reacting to the social networks. Uh, you build trust in investing the social networks. This is also a big lesson. How many of us are followers of the uh, WHO or uh, the French Ministry of Health? Do they only have a, a, an account on uh, Instagram? I don't know. Mm. Or on YouTube, maybe. But they should. Uh, and, and I'm not uh, 14 years old when I say that. I just see that the main source of information of people, not only young people in the world, uh, is not their parents or their governments or the TV news. It is uh, the social networks. This is the second lesson. We don't do enough uh, to be trusted on the social networks. The last lesson is about big data. Uh, you have one uh, consistent move uh, from countries which is to protect their data, to see it on their medical data like on golden eggs. And it is very good for, um, let's say, privacy reasons. Of course, you must protect the people and you must protect their medical data. But there is a power of big data in uh, facing crises like COVID which is underused, in my opinion. In fact, you should at the same time protect privacy, but share massively medical data, not only uh, results of research. Medical institutions, of course, share the results. But could they share the data? Could they share the raw data to melt it in big data pool so that people can uh, work on it and more rapidly uh, work on evidence-based medicine. In my opinion, this is a massive field of international cooperation because, of course, I don't think we want uh, Google or Microsoft uh, to, to, to do this instead of governments because this is what they will do if nobody does it. These are the, lesson, the lessons, personally, I have learned in this crisis. Thank you very much, Jean. I think you, you stressed th three things. One is the need for anticipation. The second is uh, you emphasized the complexity of behind trust and the relationship between decision maker, the science, the public opinion. And third, uh, this issue, which I agree is critical, of sharing data, pulling data together. Basically, you're, you're saying we need a global CDC. Um, in our terminology, and that should be the role of a strengthened WHO to me uh, in the future. Thank you. Um, so let's now turn to health systems and uh, a perspective from health systems and healthcare workers. So I turn to you, uh, Robert. Merci, Michel. Uh, Permettez-moi tout d'abord de remercier Thierry de Montbrial et le staff du World Policy Conference. C'est un très grand plaisir d'être ici, et j'allais dire d'être ici physiquement, et de retrouver des collègues, des personnes et des experts que j'ai eu l'occasion de retrouver à Marrakech. Merci à vous. So I will give the standpoint of healthcare providers. Uh, I'm a physician, I'm the CEO of a hospital which had to take care of thousands of patients since February last year and I would like to share with you our perspective. I would like to insist on three points. Number one is how important it is to have a coordination of healthcare providers. Number two is, as was said, the problem of the question of anticipation of uh, what can be a pandemic. And number three is a technology. But just before uh, 
I cannot not say that we have to have gratitude for all the nurses, all the doctors which were at the forefront. Uh, in my hospital, I had nurses who just came out of the school. They were 20, 22 years old, and they had to fight first line with uh, uh, this uh, war, in fact. And we had uh, hundreds, we, in fact, we had one, more than 100 of our doctors and nurses which were ill, some of them very seriously. Thank God we had no death casualty, but there was some death casualty, so we have to have our gratitude for this person. So let's come with the coordination of healthcare providers. What makes the fight effective is a coordination between general practitioners and hospitals, between the private sector and the public sector, something which doesn't, is not obvious. Most important was the coordination orchestrated by public agencies in France, in the Paris region, which is approximately 10 million people. You have l'Agence Régionale de Santé, the, the regional healthcare agency, and they played a key role in distributing the protective, the, the drugs when there was a shortage of drugs, in distributing the masks when there was a, a shortage of masks, in triaging the patients, and in at some point making the decision to evacuate some patients from the Paris area to other regions. This was paramount. Second is anticipation. In anticipation for healthcare providers, there is a scheme at the level of hospital, and it's called emergency plans. Unfortunately for France, we had emergency plans which appeared to be very effective following the terrorist attacks in November 15. So we, we know how to deal with an influx of wounded or death, and we had to reactivate these plans uh, for the pandemics. It's called Le Plan Blanc, the white, uh, the white okay. plan. And this was the case for all uh, French hospitals. Number two, of course, in terms of uh, anticipation, equipment, personal protective protection equipment. Uh, I remember very well, at some point in our hospital, we didn't have enough masks for, uh, for uh, everybody. And I can tell you that I felt very bad with the idea to send a nurse and doctors into a room of a patient without the masks. Then, of course, there are the respirators and the drugs. More important is anticipation for infrastructure. Today, in Germany, or in 2020, sorry, in Germany, there was, in terms of intensive care unit beds per 100,000, the number for Germany was 34. The number for France was 16. The number for Italy was 8.6. 8 and so the decision to increase this number of beds or not to increase is of course paramount because either you get the, these infrastructures or you don't get them, and this is key. Even more important in terms of anticipation are the skills. You can have the respirators, you can have the beds, but if you don't have the properly trained nurses and if you don't have the properly trained intensivists, reanima doctors who worked in reanimation, and this takes seven to 10 years to take this person. So it's a long run that you have to do. Number three is technology. So I'm not an expert, but everyone, everybody understands that getting the vaccines in less than a year was unprecedented. Jean just alluded to big data, digitization, data governance. It's very clear that it played a role and that it will play an even more important role. We all know that medical progress for wars, unfortunately. Let's say that it's a good side effect of wars. I remember very well, during the first Gulf War, there was a sending from imaging, medical imaging, CTs, literally from the battlefield to the vessels, to the, with, with uh, uh, the, Na the US Navy vessels with hospitals, and from there to Germany. And this was able to make a better triage of the patients and to evacuate the patients. In the years after, the US Army uh, uh, healthcare system invested one dollar out of two in digitization. Today, hospitals are completely digitized. We share images, we share data, and this was really a, a very important uh, move and clearly linked to uh, a benefit of, uh, of the war. I would like to conclude on the, another point, which is uh, the weight of politics uh, for healthcare providers. 
Of course, uh, if you are a healthcare, if you are in charge of a hospital, uh, what is paramount is the uh, amount of money that the nation will spend, let's say in terms of GDP, if you are at less than 10, more than 10, of course it has an impact and we all understand and we all follow year after year how much the government, etc., will invest in healthcare. But in the case of the pandemics, it was much more immediate, it was much more uh, consistent. Let me give you one or two examples. Mandating vaccination. Before, France has been resistant to vaccination for whatever cultural reason, but before the summer, in health French hospital, the level of healthcare staff which were vaccinated was around 60%. Then the government and Macron decided to put that mandating vaccination in for all healthcare staff in the hospital. Today, we are at 96, 97%. So it had an immediate effect. The effect of politics was absolutely immediate. Number two, as Jean said, was fighting disinformation. Today, the reality of intensive care units in France is that we get patients in which refuse to be vaccinated for all these crazy reasons, so we have to fight effectively this disinformation. We have to reinforce, of course, the cooperation at the international level, as Juliette said, because we know that if we don't help, if we don't work with Africa, we will have the consequence in the future of not having been able to work properly with our African colleagues. And finally, I would like to say something. Of course, uh, what the, we have learned over the last uh, year and a half is that the state have reinforced their role, and probably rightly so, but let's not fight in the future the previous battle. What is emerging very rapidly today is the GAFA. The GAFA today are not today prominent players in their healthcare, but they will be. They will be in the next five to 10 years. They will play a very important role. And so let's not forget these things and not just fight the battle of the past, but also the battle of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. And thank you for, among other things, um, stressing again the importance of anticipation and, and preparedness. Uh, which other colleagues have already uh, also discussed. Clearly, too, too many national um, plans have been underfunded and too many countries um, haven't, have lacked solid preparedness. Uh, this is a, a key issue. Many countries have preparedness plans, but these plans are not funded. And this is one, this is why one of the first aims of this international financing facility that the G20 is discussing, that the independent panel has been proposing, is to fund preparedness across the world. And then in an interdependent world, we need to be mutually accountable for how we prepare. And this is why uh, on the initiative of France and, and Germany, among others, uh, in Geneva, we're now discussing a peer review of preparedness in a UN-driven mechanism, similar to what's happening at, at the Human Rights Council, where countries would be reviewed by peers every year, uh, or every second or third year, for, their, uh, for how they move in, into preparedness. Thank you very much again, and so let me uh, turn now um, Haruka, uh, Dr. Haruka uh, Sakamoto to you from Japan. You've been listening to us. Uh, thank you for your patience and uh, uh, welcome. Hi, Ari. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about my opinion about how global health governance has changed during the COVID-19. And then I also would like to talk about how the various actors make up the global health governance, especially the platforms in which Japan is involved. So uh, what my understanding is that even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges of the global health governance had been pointed out. In particular, since the outbreak of the Ebola in the West Africa in 2014, a need for structural reform of the WHO and then the coordination throughout the UN organization 
the absence of the leadership at the global level have been pointed out as a major problem of the global health governance. Also, as a result of the aforementioned governance problems, the inability to provide global public goods such as vaccines and therapeutics in an appropriate and timely manner, and the inability of the international community to stop the spread of infectious diseases have also been seen as a problem. So after the Ebola outbreak, in response to such discussion, WHO reforms and then UN-wide coordination mechanisms have been discussed and then made a significant effort to improve such organizational challenges. In addition, the World Bank's PEF and then WHO's CFE and then several other financial mechanisms have been proposed and established as part of the discussions on how to handle finances during the crisis. So in this context, COVID-19 occurred, and then my personal feeling is that the issue of global health governance that have been discussed in the past have been exposed again this time of the COVID-19. So it may include the structural problem of WHO and the relationship between the WHO and the national sovereignty. Also, so the WHO has various policy tools for pandemics, such as international health regulation or IHR, they are not legally binding like the IAEA. So as these are already pointed out in the IPPPR report, everyone would agree that it is necessary to discuss on WHO reform and then also the structure about WHO as well as the United Nations as a whole by reflecting on the failures and lessons we got from the COVID-19 pandemic this time. But I'd like to point out one point, I'd like to uh, mention one point. So there seems to be a lot of criticism on the WHO, but I don't think it necessarily means that WHO did not play a sufficient role this time. So, of course, there are many challenges, but for example, looking at the WHO Western Pacific region, of which Japan is a member, I feel that the WHO has played a very significant role, especially at the country level. So this region, Western Pacific region, has been confronted with various pandemics in the past, such as SARS and the novel influenza. So by preparing for the pandemics based on the past experiences, the number of deaths in the region has been relatively low compared to the other regions. So the WHO regional office and the country office and the Ministry of Health in each country in the region have worked closely together from the early stages of the outbreak to share information. And then regional office and then country office have provided technical assistance to countries as needed. So that due to the strong relationship between the WHO and the Ministry of Health in each country in the normal times, I feel that the presence and importance of the WHO, especially at the country level, has been reconfirmed this time. So there are certain roles that only the WHO can play, especially in the relation to the Ministry of Health. And then I feel that these roles need to be properly evaluated when we're discussing about the WHO reform. And I also would like to really personally commend the ACT Accelerator and then the COVAX framework that have been newly created this time. Of course, the provision of vaccines through COVAX has not necessarily achieved equitable global vaccine distribution. Rather, as some already pointed out, there is an overwhelming disparity in the vaccine supply between the high-income countries and the low-income countries. However, if COVAX had not been in place, the gap between high- and low-income countries may have even wider than it is now. So, uh, it is a fact that there are at least some countries that have been benefited from the vaccines via COVAX. So, on the other hand, yes, it, we already discussed in some, but as has already been pointed out, how to involve the donors more in the COVAX and then how to strengthen authority to secure the necessary funds and distribute vaccines fairly remain issue to be addressed. I also would like to talk about the uh, importance of the bilateral cooperation. So, not only from a multilateral perspective, but the impact of bilateral cooperation on the global health governance should also be considered. For example, in the case of the vaccine provision, Japan has provided a huge number of vaccines through the COVAX. On the other hand, Japan has also been actively providing vaccines as part of the bilateral cooperation, especially to the countries that are strategically close to Japan, such as Taiwan and Vietnam. So while cooperating in a multilateral framework, Many major donors are actively providing support in the bilateral framework 
because they can provide a surprise more quickly and then have diplomatic advantage in terms of the strengthening relationship with partner countries. Also, in terms of the impact of bilateral cooperation on the global health governance, China's influence is also noteworthy. So many people are already aware of the fact that China is actively providing a Chinese-made vaccine to other countries. And in addition, it is also actively providing oxygen and healthcare staff. So China's vaccine diplomacy has naturally stimulated many Western donors in Japan, and it will be interesting to see how the world responds to this. So global health governance was discussed considerably, consider, considerably after the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in 2014, but China's influence has become more pronounced since that time. So there are various moves to deal with China's influence on the global health, one of which is the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or so-called Quad, which is a framework proposed by the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in the past, and then consisting of the four countries, such as India, United States, Japan, and Australia. And it aims to promote peace and stability in the Pacific region. Just a few days ago, the first face-to-face -face meeting of the Quad was held, where the leaders of the four countries met and then agreed to further collaborate in terms of the COVID-19 response, including the vaccination provision. Also, another possible platform that could involve China would be the G20. Even before the COVID-19, platforms such as the G7 and the G20 had been increasing their presence in the global health governance. For example, the Ebola epidemic of 2014 led to the first summit discussion of the health security at the G7 Elmau Summit in Germany in 2015. The following year, 2016, the G7 Isashima Summit was held in Japan, and then Prime Minister Abe at the time advocated the importance of the health security as well as the importance of the crisis-resilient health delivery system. So there's a note, and then also the G20 summit recently discussed about health security and then health care system, which is well prepared for the future pandemic. So there's a no doubt that the G20 will be a platform for thinking about how to confront and then how to cooperate with China. So uh, finally, we should also pay close attention to the fact that there are some past achievements that have been useful this time of the pandemic. One such example is the Coalition for the Epidemic Prepared Innovation, or so-called the CEPI. This initiative launched at the World Economic Forum in 2070 was jointly established by the Japanese government, several other government, pharmaceutical companies, and philanthropic organizations, such as the Gates Foundation. And it aims to rapidly research and develop drugs and vaccines for pandemic that are not in demand during normal time. So some of the vaccines widely available for COVID-19 today are provided through the framework of the CEPI. So in the conclusion, global health governance is often discussed in the negative terms, such as the weakening of the WHO, the absence of the leadership, and the structure of the US-China conflict being brought into the global health. And then all of them are true. So the WHO itself has several challenges, and then it is also true that global health governance is not functioning sufficiently in the COVID-19. On the other hand, it should also be noted that WHO has steadily cooperating with each member states, especially at the country level, and that the lessons learned from the past pandemic have played a major role in the COVID-19, such as safety. And the international solidarity frameworks, such as the COVAX, though incomplete, have been helpful. So when we think about the global health governance in the future, I think those kind of less and positive aspects also be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor um, Sakamoto. Thank you. Thank you for linking somehow to our previous, uh, to the discussions of, uh, that we had earlier this morning uh, in, in, at this conference. Uh, thank you also for pointing out uh, the importance of the regional WHO networks. Instead of looking at WHO like everything has to come from Geneva, actually acknowledging the importance of the regional uh, structures. And I think this is something that, Juliette, you also alluded to, the future in as we think of governance, as we think of reforming the architecture, is to uh, have more emphasis on the regional structures. Maybe, Christian, you will agree that there are um, regional 
epidemiological and response patterns to the pandemics. And, and certainly we need um, hubs for manufacturing essential supplies, vaccines, uh, diagnostic therapeutics in each region. And we have to sort of culturally and politically adapt to regional patterns our, our governance uh, structure and our work on preparedness and response. Um, I'm afraid we're very close to the end. Uh, can I um, still uh, have time for one or two questions from the, from the audience? <coughs> yes, please. My name is Volker Peretis. I'm the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Sudan. And just to, to add a little bit of evidence, in Sudan, we could show that COVAX works. We got 800,000 doses of vaccines through the COVAX initiatives, plus probably 200,000 doses from member countries. So it works, but it also show how, shows how, how insufficient that is. 800,000 plus 200,000 doses for a country of 30, 43 million means that at best we could vaccinate 1.5% of the population. Yeah. Now, if we are coming into a situation where less than 2% of the people are vaccinated in Africa and other developing regions, and 60, 70, 80% of people are vaccinated in the industrialized world, we are having a, another issue of decoupling, different from the one we discussed this morning when we spoke about the West and China, and we have another division of the world which is not healthy to anybody. And I would like to bring the discussion back to global governance and, and both the chair and and Mr. Kramars uh, and uh, our Japanese speaker went very much into some of the, the necessities here. And I've heard comparisons this morning where some of you compared the situation with the fight against global terrorism, with the preparation for war. Um, I mean, all these analogies are sort of useful to, for our thinking, but I would like also, because there are many economists here in the room, to draw a comparison to how we dealt with the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, which I think we did much more efficiently. Now, global governance, we all know, works best when heavy national interests of the heavyweights in the world are involved. And in the financial crisis, this was definitely the case. And it seems to me, I'm happy to be corrected, or in this case, I would be unhappy to be corrected, that with regard to financial risks, global cooperation Multilateral cooperation through things like the Financial Action Task Force is still functioning despite the rivalry between US and China, uh, which we are now seeing. So my question is to both you on the panel and then people in, in the audience who would might like to comment, can we, can we take a clue from how we dealt with the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, setting up international coordination mechanisms that have actually have been working and have been functioning since, and that since and have been maintained until today, despite your political rivalries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. And first, thank you for your comment on COVAX, that there are areas where people actually see the benefits of COVAX, but you've also pointed out first that the amount, the number of vaccines that came in is far below what is needed. And second, of course, we can't sustainably, as Juliette uh, Twakli already say, uh, said in her intervention, rely on a system where um, the, the, the drugs, the vaccine are made in the north, sold to rich countries, and then somehow redistributed. This is, this is untenable as, as a system. We have to, to change it. But with regard to your uh, second question, um, I, I wonder, Jean-Claude uh, Jean Trichet, whether I can call on you, because the question is um, um, the analogy between the current situation and the way the 2008-2011 crisis has been held. And one of the points that your commission, the high-level financing group in the G20, was uh, making is that the s f uh, stabilization fund that was created to deal with, with, with that crisis would be a good model 
to deal with the financing of preparedness and response. So, w would you wish to, to comment on this? Can we have a microphone here? Uh, and then we'll end the session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, uh, for this question. I have to say that I was very impressed by the multidimensional vision we have after having heard uh, all members of the panel and your own remarks, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, yes, indeed, it seems to me that uh, when we discussed that, we had this analogy with the terrible crisis of the subprime and Lehman Brothers and uh, all the consequences it had on global financial and economic stability. And we thought that it was good to have this you know, new concept uh, that uh, we proposed, and I understand that it, it has some kind of emerging consensus. And we thought also that it was good to have a governance which would be uh, in a way which uh, has still to be optimized, but backed by the international community in asking the G20 to play some kind of important role. I, I know to which extent this is delicate, uh, but, but our own experience was that uh, uh, having a highly professional uh, entity that would have means and would propose a number of action that would be backed by the international community through the appropriate way. And we thought, again, that uh, the international community as a whole plus the G20 as the, having the capacity to give the uh, political might which was necessary at a global level would probably be a good solution. Now, of course, all this has to crystallize in, in decisions, and we discussed that together, by the way, Professor. So uh, I hope very much that uh, we will have the new, I would say, way of uh, coping with the next challenges. And it was said so clearly by all speakers that uh, we have also to prepare for the next pandemic, which will come, uh, unavoidably, probably. And uh, so we will see what happens. It's a question of days, in a way, now, taking into account the meeting of the G20. Thank you very much. With this, uh, I'd like to close the session and really thank uh, all panelists and, and you for the audience, uh, in the audience for being so active. Thank you.